You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Susan Richard Shreve. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to four, that's the number four, thewords.com. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the the seat-in-the-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Dark Revenant, Chronicle of the Five, Book One by Garrick Godrick. A peculiar boy with a remarkable ability, a secret society on a dark crusade, an extraordinary device that could change the world. 14-year-old Cody Calder is a frightened, insecure boy who wants nothing more than to find courage and self-worth. 
He has a difficult decision to make. He can go with his family and confront his fears or stay behind and hide at his uncle's farm. If he stays, he must say goodbye to the two most important people in his life. If he goes, his decision could change him forever. Cody's choice lands him in a faraway place where he finds himself on an unexpected path filled with mind-bending twists of fate and decision, and Cody's quest for self-discovery becomes a nightmare as he struggles to survive in an extraordinary new world, one he never knew existed. Pick up today, Dark Revenant, Chronicle of the Five, Book One. We're going to be talking more about this amazing series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Susan Richard Shreve on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book. It's called More News Tomorrow, and this is one of the most unique books that I've read this year. It's fascinating. It's uh, enthralling. It will keep you turning pages, and you just might learn a little something about yourself in this book. Uh, Welcome to the show, Susan. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here, Hank. Thank you. I'm excited to have you. Um, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um, at the dinner table when I was quite a little girl, and my father was a journalist, and he started off as a crime reporter, and it was clear that if I was going to be heard, I'd have to tell a story that interested him. So it really started there. His stories were pretty terrific, and so mine were just lies. I was pleased with them because of that. But he did listen. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So that that was your first lesson in audience engagement. That was my first lesson in audience <laughs> engagement. I love that. So your your dad was a was a reporter and uh, a journalist. Uh, what about your mom? Did did she encourage? Uh, the arts she was the one with the um with the real crazy imagination and i think in so many ways she probably um was more of a model to me for what i wanted to do though she didn't do that but she encouraged it and her own imagination was uh way beyond mine oh, that's fantastic um, do you do you remember uh, writing stories in school or um, you know, taking assignments and 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 thinking, oh, I'll 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 be great at this? You know, I I cannot say that I was much encouraged by my teachers who felt that I made up the things that, in fact, I'd been asked to report on. So I just, I, for a long time, I did plays in our living room where my brother played the role of a dog. He's younger than I am, therefore was willing to be a dog. And uh, I did it with plays for a long time. Uh, and then I started to write it down. But I didn't until I got to college actually feel that I could do this and that I didn't exactly know, and I didn't go to graduate school. I don't have an MFA. Um, I didn't exactly know how one went about doing this, uh, writing fiction. But I did, and I didn't know any fiction writers at that point. Um, But I did know that I wanted to, in some way, make a life telling stories, whether in theater or or in in actually what turned out to be writing the stories as as a as a book. Do you do you remember Susan if there was uh, an author or a book or a series that that opened your imagination and maybe gave you confidence to think that uh, you know I could tell a story like this or this is this is the vein that I would like to uh, to be in with my art. I think it was when I really started reading serious fiction. Um, I had a lot of true romances under my bed. I knew I didn't have much interest in writing those. But it was also true that two particular writers who were strong voice writers, and I think that's something that I wanted to be, were J.D. Salinger and Scott Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and they were big influences on me. And then the first um, 
actual teacher that I had was a writer named Peter Taylor from Tennessee. I hear a little Southern in your voice. Yes, ma'am. And he was a wonderful um, character writer. And it was, I felt very honored to be in his class. And actually, he sent me to my first editor. Salinger and Fitzgerald were definitely two writers with distinct voices and, and very strong voices. Um, when you would read them, but but not only distinct and strong, but but not similar. Um, they they right. each had their, their very own character. When you read those and you 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 felt the um, the strong voice there, what did what did that challenge you to do in your own writing? I think for Salinger, it was that irreverent, um, deeply personal. Uh, engaging voice, and also somebody who was always on the edge of, uh, you know, American loneliness, I think. And, um, and I had just never heard that voice before. Fitzgerald's was more familiar. He came out of a romantic tradition and, and sort of wrote beautiful sentences and um, so the combination of those two, and they were very different, you're right, uh, is when I began to find my voice, thought that I could write something that was by me instead of was by everybody else. Well, I think it's a, it's a great revelation when you learn that you can be honest and open and kind of raw and the, the way Salinger would be, um, but still write – sentences that are beautiful and can be appreciated and, and really love language. You, you can be both. It, it was really, it is really true. And you use a word that to me was the other turnaround word for me, and that is honest. And, um, and that took a while, that business of really um, going there and telling the truth as you saw it in a way that might not reflect well on you. And that that is the difficult thing, uh, and but but that's kind of what we're called to do as as writers is to expose the human condition, um, kind of no matter what the cost. Exactly, and sometimes it's the human condition as we see in ourselves, isn't it? Right. Exactly. So, so you uh, in in college, this is kind of awakened in you. What what was the first project that you that you wrote and finished? Um, that let you know that you would be a writer, uh, and maybe maybe you didn't even publish it, but the, the, you know we all have that book that that got you from beginning to end, and whether it published or not, that was the thing that let you know that it could be done. Yeah, that's a biggie, isn't it? It is. I mean, it, of, of actually knowing that you can write a book. Mine was terrible. I wrote a book in college. It was terrible. I didn't know it was terrible, so I thought you wrote a book. You found somebody in New York to take it to. You took it to that person, and then it was published. I was reasonably innocent. And so I did all of that, and I took it to – I happened to know someone whose father was a literary agent, and I took it to him, and he said he thought it was a nice thing. I'd written a book, and I said, you know, I'm sort of the age of Francoise Sagan when she wrote her – first book and he said well she knew a lot more than you did when she did it and oh, I, it was it was good for me it was yeah. a good thing for me because I really did think that this is just something you do and something happens and of course it never does no matter how many books write you write it never is going to be an easy ride sure wow um so what was the when did uh, well, what was the first book that you published? The first, and that book, needless to say, was not published. Right. Uh, the first book that I was pub that I published, I published um, was called "A Fortunate Madness," and um, I published it in 1973. What do you feel like was the the difference in, uh, in in the one that you did publish and the ones that you thought you might publish? What can you tell? What the uh, what the missing element was? Well, clearly you're a writer too. And I think for me, 
is something that writers generally know. I could tell when I was writing that book um, that it was something different. Right. I was not. It, 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 the language on the page, the imagination of the story, the imagining of the story um, was just something different than I'd, that I'd written before. And I never, even as a teacher, been able to say what that relationship to the truth was. But I, I, that's, there was an authenticity, I think is the word. Right. Well, it's like if, if we could put our finger on whatever that X factor is, um, then we could bottle it and sell it. But it, it really comes down to to uh, to finding the truth and, 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 uh, and being able to convey it. And I think, like you said, you, you know it when it happens. You know it when it happens. And I guess I think you approach every book with as a virgin. Right. Now, through your career, not only have you written uh, – quite a number of books, but you've also uh, taught writing. What, what was your path to, uh, that led you to, uh, to, to train other writers? You know, um, I was teaching high school and I had four little children and I had to teach every day. This is not going to be a high minded thing, Hank. I had to teach every day and I was responsible for uh, doing a lot of things I didn't particularly want to do, like coaching. And um, and I had written one novel and was in the process of writing another, and this job at George Mason University came up, which was a brand-new university. They were going to hire any writer they could find who had a book on the street, and I just happened to walk through the door. So I was incredibly lucky, but I also, for a long time, didn't, it wasn't an MFA, it was undergraduate comp, uh, but I started the MFA there, and kind of because it was a young university, was able, the writers there were able to do it the way they wanted to do it, and it was, it was a blast in a lot of ways. What's interesting to me is... Um uh, that when you teach, inevitably you you learn as you teach others, um, and it's this strange thing that happens that uh, the the act of teaching actually opens up uh, things to you, the teacher that uh, that you never would have thought before. Um, how do you feel like your your time teaching helped you personally in your uh, creative craft? Immeasurably, it helped me. Um, and it was it, it, it was really having to think about the kinds of ways you criticize someone's fiction who is doing basically the best they can. And so you have to examine it with a certain amount of care. And I think since I didn't have an MFA and since I had never looked at as writing as um, in the in the way, for example, you would look at carpentry. How do we square these corners? Um, I began to be able to look at it that way, and that was helpful to me, incredibly helpful, because I didn't have any of the language that so many people. I have a son who went to, to get an MFA, and he is a novelist, and. Um, and I was amazed at the things he learned in school that I had to learn essentially by trial and error. So it was, um, then there were always the surprises in teaching when somebody delivers something that you're amazed by and you really look at how did he or she do that? What did they do? And in that sense, they really are teaching you. Right. Uh, speaking of MFAs, uh, the uh, the Master of Fine Arts program usually elicits very strong opinions uh, one way or the other from people. People are very rarely lukewarm on it. People either love it and think that, uh, that an MFA program is the missing element that they needed for their writing or people say – uh, writers just need to go right. Um, in, in your opinion, what, what do you think the benefit uh, of 
a program like that is? Reading. Uh, you know, I am one of the naysayers of an MFA. I started one. I um, I tried to persuade my son not to go to one. I felt as though I would not have done well in one, and I don't think I would have. I, I, I don't want my work looked at so early. But in truth, I think they read a lot. They learn how to read. And for some, it's just time. The problem that I have and the the other older colleague that I teach with, I am one older colleague, he is another. Both of us are the only people who do not have MFAs in our program. And both of us feel a little bit as though, what do they want to do? What do you want to do at the end of a law school? You want to be a lawyer or you want to certainly be working in the law. If you have an MFA, there is no promise whatsoever that you're going to be a writer. And you're going to be a writer if you become a writer. And there's always has been a sort of nagging feeling that um, all the enthusiasm expressed in class and in individual conferences is promising something that we will never be able to deliver these students. It's pretty much up to them. And I know I was told by Peter Taylor once, um, you know, it's it's a matter of temperament. And I do think a lot of it is just, you know, brushing yourself off and going out again. In in your writing career, you have published uh, quite a number of children's books, uh, some nonfiction, uh, a memoir and, uh, and and quite a number of novels. Uh, do you see a a uniting thread that runs through all of your work? I do. Um, I I mean, I I suppose in the simplest old-fashioned form, I'm a storyteller. And and I have always had a real fascination with people for two years. The memoir is about two years that I lived in the Warm Springs Polio Foundation. I had polio as a baby. And they were able to do sort of amazing things between the ages of 11 and 13 when I was there and had a lot of surgeries. And my parents were not there. And it it gave me this sort of unprotected, probably more frightened than I thought, way of looking at people of engineering my own life in a hospital setting that was just full of kids, all of us having had the same problems. And I, I think that it, it, um, it was the first book I wrote, and then it was the memoir. Um, and I think that it gave me a sense of the world. It was in Georgia. The Warm Springs is in Georgia. Um, it, it gave me a sense of the world that you have only when you're out there alone and you're young. You know that sense that you have, it's like traveling alone. Um, That sense that you have that I'm responsible for my own well-being and you become super alert. And I think the super alertness that I had at Warm Springs, as well as the need for my imagination to entertain me, because there wasn't a lot going on, wasn't, you know, no fun and games. Um had a great value. So those are the things that I have a great interest in character in, in my work and in telling a story. And I also have this thing that I have been criticized for before, but I feel a sense that, um, I I don't want to let my characters down and give them a dreadful end. So it's not that I'm writing happily ever after, but I do want some sense of optimism. And that, I think, the novel can offer in a way that other forms can't, because you know so much about the life of your characters. Right. Well, and, and, you know, we live in a pretty dark, strange world um, oh, yeah. sometimes now. And, and if we can if we can get a little hope from a novel, I think that's a good thing. I do, too. I really do. And books have always been an escape for me, a place to live 
which I trust. I, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, your new book, More News Tomorrow, is a is a family drama at its uh, at its heart, at its core. Um, in looking at your work, it looks to me like this is another unifying theme uh, to your work is is relationships and the importance of you know we talked earlier about telling the truth about the human condition, uh, and sometimes that means being in relationship with with one another, and sometimes we don't have all of the control. Uh, in a situation, sometimes we share that with other people, and that that tension and that dynamic that we see there makes for great stories. Yeah, I think I've always been interested in family relationships, in part because I had a tiny family, and um, I wanted a sense of belonging to a bigger family, so I made them up. But I'm I'm really interested in the, that sort of first. When I was quite young and before I went to Warm Springs, my father drew this on the back of a postcard, um, these circles. And the circle started with me and then it was the family and got bigger and bigger and bigger until until it was the world. Uh, And it was about your place. And of course, your place begins as very small. And I think that I have been really interested in family din- dynamics and the way relationships um, as, at, at a very early age can really change the way you live. And I honestly think that for most of us, and this is going to fi- sign sort of, sound sort of psychobabbly, um, it, we're always working out our mother and father, just working out that whole relationship that we are born into and grow up and live with and struggle with and try to make make as good as it gets, can get. So those kinds of stories always interest me. And in this particular book, uh, it was the first time I've written about anybody my age for a long time. Mostly I write about people about 30 years younger. Um, it makes you feel younger to write about people 30 years younger. And I, this time I wrote about a character my own age and how she has created a family and how complicated it is to do and how much danger there is in doing it. Well, speaking of her, um, Georgie or Georgiana Mm -hmm. Grove, uh, as, as we meet in the book, what, where does she come from? And uh, how did how did you start envisioning her? You know, I was I, I started with the kid, the one who writes the diary, and I was very sure about that kid. I, I, I knew who he was, but he was not going to be able to make a story. So the first part of it I wrote was his first diary entry, and then I began to think about this woman who's father has murdered her mother, at least confessed to murdering her mother, leaving her an orphan. And how would she feel about that? Who would she be at 70 years old since she was four at the time? And how would she feel about her father? And the way Georgie feels about her father is she wants to think he was what a girl wants a father to be. And she doesn't want him Um, to have done this. And so essentially the story quite simply is that she makes a decision when she hears from the only other person who was at the place, which is a campsite where her mother was murdered. He writes her a letter on her 70th birthday and she makes a decision to go back to that place. She's an anthropologist. She believes the earth reveals its secrets. She makes the decision to go back to that place and take her whole family with her. So Georgie had to be somebody um, of some complexity and a, a character that I liked and also thought was sort of crazy and um, that adored her children, but at the same time, Took a very took them on a very dangerous trip. She's a complicated character, and um, and so my imagining of her 
to go back to what I said at the beginning is it's different to be a 70 year old woman than it is to be a 40 year old woman. And I can't even put that into very specific words, but by creating Georgie, I was creating her with all her warts in a way that, that, um, you know, them, you know, them, there's this new book that's coming out, uh, by Elizabeth Strout called Olive again about Olive Kittredge. And it's a book in which Olive knows herself better and Georgie knows herself. The, the book is, is a really, um, interesting, uh, because when, when you think, you know what the story is, okay, I know where Susan's going here. This is going to be a great character study. Um, and, and you kind of settle in to, uh, to that being what the book is. Then all of a sudden, um, there's a mystery here. And then there are all of these, uh, these great societal, um, issues that we're dealing with all while in this page turning, uh, book, um, when when you started kind of getting to know the characters, did did all of these plot points and all of the the situations that were going to evolve in this book did did you know those from the beginning, or did the characters just kind of start getting into all this trouble as you wrote? I did not. When I was a young writer, I, I felt very um, uncomfortable unless I pretty much knew where a book was going to end. I didn't know where this book was going to end. The only thing I knew was to put a bunch of people on a river for pretty much a whole book was not going to be easy. And they would have been, you know, it would have been easier to fly them to London for a couple of days, but they are, the the location is, is, um, is, both one I don't know, but I could imagine. And um, it it was one that made me have to work on this book and what was going to happen and how it was going to move and what it was going to reveal. But I wanted this family in some kind of isolation on a trip that really only two of them wanted to take and the rest were pretty furious about it. I I wanted that kind of family tension to exist. So it came and it came sort of slowly. And I've never taken seven years to write a book, but I took seven years to write this book. So, Wow. And what a fantastic book it is. Um, if, if, uh, if you were going to describe this story to someone um, who, who knew nothing about your work or the kinds of stories you told, Um, What what would you tell them that the story is about? I think, to my mind, in the end, the story is about the secrets that you find when you're looking for some other answer, the answers you find when you're looking for something else. And Georgie in this book is really looking for home. She never had a home. She created a home, but she never had a home because her parents died young and violently. And um, and so in in fact, she's looking to find out whether her father was covering for somebody when he confessed to murdering her mother. But in truth, she finds something else out. So it's about those surprises that come to you in life that I think are very often the surprises that turn you a little in another direction, sometimes a richer direction, sometimes not. But if you're open to them, uh, you can embrace them, and she does. I I think there there are a lot of parallels between uh, the story and and Georgie's life and experiences and that – of the the life of a writer and the the discoveries that are made along the way when when you are at the place that you are and have had such a an illustrious writing career um are there still surprises uh for you and and does the 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 craft of storytelling still kind of take your breath away at some at sometimes absolutely absolutely and that's really an interesting way of putting it because i haven't I haven't thought about this as the story of a writer 
uh, I mean, she's, you know, as the process of a writer, uh, but it very definitely is. And it very definitely was for me in that book and this book. And, um, and I think what I, what I discovered in this book more than anything in terms of learning through your own work um, in a way that puts you in another place as a writer, and I don't mean a better or worse place, but a different place, um, was how much you can condense and still imply. The, uh, the new book is called More News Tomorrow. Uh, Susan, I absolutely love this book. It's fantastic. Uh, I can't wait for everyone to get their hands on it. Um, if, if people are just learning about you, uh, is there a place where they can find out more about you and, and connect with, uh, with all that you're doing? www.susanshreve.com. It's my website, and it's, it's – uh, I had to do a new one for this book. I couldn't uh, couldn't look 35 anymore. And so I did a new one and it's um a, a, it, I really love the website which usually I usually you don't love websites. Uh but I really like this website and it has a lot that I've done and a lot that I'm doing. It has the other books that I've written and um so that's where you can find me. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up their copy of More News Tomorrow. Uh, Susan, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. I'm thrilled to talk to you, Hank. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories Podcast. Be sure to subscribe at hankgarner.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. The ancient building wore the severe cassock colors of a Puritan minister a uniform monochrome of slate-gray shingles and soot-gray clabberts, its shadowed upper windows cross-hatched like the facets of a spider's eye. The second story protruded beyond the first and bore the house's only ornament, two gray teardrops of wood, weeping from each corner of the building's stiff upper lip. The place would have looked sinister and foreboding in its shadowed alley if not for the die-cut silhouette of a dancing sheep, jaunty above the door, and the two front bay windows that blazed with colorful, welcoming light. The windows were hung with orbs of colored glass on staggered lengths of ribbon. Each orb glowed with autumnal reds and delicate greens, burgundy tints and pumpkin hues, dappled raspberry and clover lime, streaked with light and weightless as bubbles over a cauldron. The shelves below offered crystal skulls and silver daggers and horny devils, Celtic chalices and woven dream catchers in dreamcoat hues. A primitive broom leaned in a corner, ready for flight, and a rhapsodic nude in bronze clutched her goat-legged lover beneath a jackal bust of Anubis. The interior of the shop was even witchier. Above a crude and sooty fireplace, a stack of brick barely holding the shape of a chimney pushed through the barn-high roof, threading ancient beams that crisscrossed overhead. Brooms and kettles and Christmas lights dangled from these, alongside Halloween costumes and Chinese umbrellas, pointy hats and bundles of herbs. Jason wandered deeper into the shop. His fingers trailed across strange bronze statuary and Aztec masks of turquoise and lapis lazuli. He rolled his eyes at the luck candles and money charms, but goggled indecently at a nude and anatomically correct silver nymph with long golden hair that reminded him of Kate. See anything you like? Jason jumped, turned, and jumped again. The woman standing before him was the living embodiment of every hippy-dippy counterculture type he'd ever seen. Her hair was green, her face pale and round, her doughy body wrapped in some elaborately woven ethnic garb. Her eyebrows were black and pierced in little rows, and her eyes were heavily circled with midnight blue, as if she'd been sucker-punched by an oil slick. She tapped the glass over the nymph. Admiring the goddess, I see. Oh, uh, um. She practically caught him with porn. You want to hold her? She won't break. Here. The woman flipped open a glass door and handed Jason the naked figure. 
See how heavy she is? You could bang her against the wall all day and barely make a dent. She waggled her eyebrows, obviously enjoying his discomfort. He checked the price tag. Seven hundred bucks? The goddess is a symbol of love and fertility. Don't be ashamed of desiring her. The woman's long green fingernails plucked a long black cigarette from a long red case, and she lit it. I sense, she blew smoke and studied its whirls. Dissatisfaction in love? Yes, I have just the thing. She pulled Jason into a side room where the smell of her clove smoke gave way to the skunky aromas of potpourri sachets, tea leaves, and hanging clutches of twiggy flowers. She searched, found a little bundle, and pressed it into his hand. This will make you irresistible. Rub it on your nethers twice a day, and love shall surely find you. Jason made a face. The bundle smelled like cow manure. He didn't even want that on his hands. <laughs>